How many of you guys have ever heard that? It's not fair. How many of you guys have ever said, it's not fair? If you have kids, you've probably heard it a hundred times. Go clean your room. Well, that's not fair, right? Why isn't it fair? I don't know. Ask your mama. <laughs> Love these kids. I think at some point in time, we've all gotten to the point where we said that phrase, life is just not fair. I remember the story of a middle-aged woman. Uh, she had collapsed in her home, had a heart attack. As the ambulance was coming to pick her up, took her to the emergency room, took her into uh, surgery. As she was on the table, she died. And as she was standing before God, she looked at him and said, is this it? And God looked at her and said, no, I'm going to send you back. you got 30 more years. And with that, she woke up. She was in recovery. And she decided if she has 30 more years, she's going to do it right. And so she, while she was recovering in the hospital, she went ahead and had her nose done. She had all kinds of plastic surgery done. She got everything redone that she could think of. She said, if I'm going to be 30 more years on this earth, I might as well do it right. And so as she recovered, she finally got released. She made her way out into the parking lot. And as she was walking across the parking lot, she got run over by an ambulance bringing someone in in an emergency. As she stood before God, she said, this is not fair. You told me I had 30 more years. And God looked at her and said, well, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was. <laughs> Sometimes life is not fair, amen? At least it appears that way. And, and I, I can't think of a better story that, that really illustrates that more than the story of Job. When you read the story of Job and you see all that he went through, and it says that Job was a righteous man. He was a righteous man. Man, he feared God, he was blameless and upright, he turned away from evil, and even after the first round of suffering, what did Job do? He tore his clothes, he fell to his knees, but he did what? He praised God. If there was anything that wasn't fair, it's what Job had to go through, right? It reminds me of many of the stories through Genesis when you look at Cain and Abel. And the offerings that they brought, and Abel's offering was accepted, but Cain's was not accepted. And we read later in Hebrews why that is, but on the surface, it looks like God is just picking favorites, right? Like life is just not fair. Or the example that we had last week with Ishmael and Isaac. Abraham loved Ishmael, but God chose Isaac. If, if you look at it on the surface, you know, that's just not fair. That God loved Jacob and he hated Esau, like we heard last week. It doesn't seem fair. At least if you're Esau, right? How is it fair that Joseph gets beaten by his brothers, thrown into a pit, and sold into slavery, and live in slavery in Egypt? And so that's really the question that's being made here. In each of these instances, it doesn't seem fair, but God worked his plan in each and every one of those instances for humanity. And so the question is raised here in this passage. We're going to be in Romans 9. Uh, we're going to be in 14 through 18. And really the idea is how should we respond in these moments where things don't seem quite fair? Or maybe it doesn't seem to be justice. And that's what we're going to be talking about in Romans 9, 14 through 8. And as you make your way there, I'm going to give you my main point from this sermon. It says this, God's mercy and compassion is displayed through His sovereign will. God's mercy and His compassion is displayed through His sovereign will. And we're going to be... In chapter 9, verses 14 through 18, if you will stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's Word this morning, and it starts in verse 14, he says this, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? 
By no means, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we come to this passage and we acknowledge that without you, we can't understand it. Without your spirit and without your understanding, we can't understand. And really, it looks like in life, sometimes things are just not fair or they're just not just. But the truth is, Lord, you're working your will. You're working your plan through humanity. And as we make our way through this passage, will you open our eyes to see the truth of what you have for us here this morning? Would you open our ears to hear it? And would you prepare our feet and our hands to put it into practice? We pray this in Jesus' name, and amen. amen. And so we're just going to take this time to recap. Last week we were in uh, verses 6 through 13, and we were talking about God's election. And the uh, pastor talked about the fact that there were two types uh, of understandings of election. Uh, now that I think of it, I can't remember. There's conditional election, right? There's conditional election, meaning that for some reason God reacts to our work, or God reacts to the things that we do, and then there's unconditional election that God has, before the foundations of the world, determined what was going to be. And so the, the idea of that brings up this question of fairness, and Paul is going to take that time to address it. And then let me just say something. Paul doesn't have this all figured out. So if you don't have it all figured out, it's okay. I don't have it all figured out. Pastor Andy doesn't have it all figured out. We're doing the best we can to understand Scripture with Scripture. And that's all we're going to do, is take Scripture at its face value. And so we're looking at election, not based on anything that we can do. And he gives those examples of Isaac and Ishmael and Jacob and Esau. And how do we reconcile that? How do we reconcile that to a loving God? And so Paul's going to tackle that in this passage, and I've broken it down into five sections. The first is this, the question of injustice, and that's really what Paul does here. He raises this question of injustice. Is it unjust for God to work in this way? And so if you look at verse 14, the first part of verse 14, it'll be on your screen as well, and it says this, what shall we say then? And we'll just stop right there. There's a natural question that arises from all of what Paul has said before. What shall we say then in relation to all of that? God's election almost seems arbitrary in some ways. How are we to respond to it? And it's something that we as Christians have to wrestle with. Is there injustice on God's part? How does it look to you? Does it seem arbitrary? Does it seem right? Well, look at the word here. The Greek word for injustice is adikia, which literally means unrighteous. So what you're asking in this question is, is God unrighteous in doing what he's doing? You see the problem with that? Is God unrighteous in doing what he's doing? It's the idea of a judge. The, the picture is of a judge who's corrupt sitting on the throne. Do you really believe that God is corrupt and sitting on his throne and just picking at whoever he wants? That's kind of the picture that that phrase for injustice means here. No, he's not. Is God corrupt? No. Is he unjust? No. Because he loves Jacob and he hates Esau, is he unjust? No. And that's the question that's being brought to the for forefront here. It reminds me of another question that we hear all too often, the question of how can God be good and allow what? Evil. And it stems from really an inadequate view of who God is and our understanding of justice. And so when we ask that question, we presume a standard. 
right? If you ask the question of whether, is God, whether God is just, you've presumed something, that there is a standard for what? Justice. And if you are a follower of Christ, what is our standard for justice? God alone is the standard for justice. So here you are asking this mute question. God alone is the standard for justice. And so you cannot ask this question of God, is God just? Because you presumed a standard of justice as it is. And God can't be anything but just. Justice is not based on our understanding, what we understand of life. You know, we only know justice and righteousness based off of the things that we want. Our fleshly desires, the desires to achieve, the desires to get ahead. But God alone is justice. He is the standard. We are finite, sinful beings. And we can only measure God by his own revealed standard. The theologian Douglas Moo says it this way. He says, imposing our own standards of right on God who created us and stands so far above us would be the height of folly and presumption. Thus, we might rephrase the question, has God acted according to his revealed character and will? And that's really the question we should be asking and the point that Paul's making here. Not is God just, but is God working according to his will, according to his plan. And that is our ultimate authority. And then he continues on and he gives us this answer to the question. So he asks this question and then he's going to answer it for us. If you look at the latter part of verse 14, is there injustice on God's part by no means? So what is Paul saying? No, but don't miss this. He's not just saying no. This is an emphatic no. Notice he doesn't just say no. He says what? By no means. Some of you might have certainly not. It's emphatic. It's not just no. It's over the top. No, certainly not. In no way. Absolutely not. Never let it be said would be an even better translation. Or the one we hear quite a bit, God forbid. Nothing could be said that way. And this point requires a very strong emphasis, and so he's doing that. He's giving them this emphatic no. But then he doesn't just stop there. He gives them an example of God's goodness in this myth. And as we read it, you might be like, well, how's that good? But trust me, it is good. And if you look at the uh, latter part of verse 15, in verse 15, uh, the last part of that verse, it says, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. That doesn't sound just, does it? We don't get to have a say in it, do we? Well, if you read it off of the, without its context, then you might come to that conclusion. But really, this is a quote from Exodus. This is a quote from Exodus 33. And if you guys remember, Moses had gone up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God. And as God was writing these commandments, the people of Israel were down there creating this God, this golden calf, and they were worshiping it. And God stops in the middle of what he's doing and says, you need to go down to your people. At that point, he had disowned them, right? You need to go down to your people, for they are sinning. And in that, Moses pleads for them. Because God said he was going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And Moses pleads, and God relents. And so Moses makes his way down the mountain to find the Israelites worshiping this golden calf. And what does he do? He takes the golden calf and he crushes it into dust. He puts it in the water and he makes them what? Is God just for doing, or is Moses just for doing that? Did they deserve it? Yeah, they deserved it. But they didn't stop there. He had the Levites come to his side and he said, you put a sword on your side and you go throughout the camp and you take out everyone you can. Did they deserve it? <laughs> 
Yeah. They deserved it. And then at the end, God goes ahead and lets this plague go throughout the camp as well. Did they deserve it? Yes. And then Moses goes back up to the mountain and he intercedes for the people again. And it says again that God relents. And in that moment, Moses says, I want to see your face. And God tells him, no, you can't see my face, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to stuff you in this cleft of the rock and I'm going to let my glory pass. And in that exchange, in Exodus 33, 19, it says this, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And so that statement now stands in context to what was going on in those events. God relented. He had mercy on the people who didn't deserve it. It's not arbitrary. It's God's plan and God's purpose and God's will. And that's the way God is. He works amongst his people. And it's born from the fact that we are all like sheep. As scripture says, we are what? We are gone astray. We all are gone astray. There's none righteous. There's no not one. We are all unrighteous. And our best righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. And so when we ask the question, is God fair or is God just, we assume a righteousness within us. You see the logic? You see the failed logic in that? We assume that there's a righteousness in ourselves and we downplay our sin nature, but the truth is we didn't deserve anything. What we deserved was death, separation from God, and we are owed nothing but such. But God, in His grace and in His mercy. The theologian James Boyce says, to raise the question of fairness presupposes that you have rights and that your rights are being violated. You see the problem there? You have no rights. If you have no rights, then you have no basis to claim that someone is treating you unfairly. Because we've all sinned without excuse thousands of times against God's holy standards, we have no right to accuse him of being unjust if he did not grant us mercy and salvation. His justice would only bring us what we deserved. And I know that's not the answer you want to hear today, but that is the answer that is right. That is the scriptural answer. We have no right to instruct Almighty God on what His plan and His will is for mankind. On what is good and what is right. And so Paul gives them this tough answer. And then he continues on and he gives them a, a proper understanding of justice in the next verse. Look at the first part of verse uh, 16. He says this, So then it depends not on human will, or exertion. So he mentions two things that it doesn't depend on. The first is human will. And that Greek word there is thelo. It literally means your personal desires or your wishes or your intentions. And what he's saying here, it doesn't matter about your best intentions. It really doesn't matter about what your wishes are. It doesn't matter about what your desires are. Your, God's justice is not based on those things. And there's no amount of desire or wish or intentions that changes what God is going to do in His people. God is sovereign in His will, and He will do what He has chosen to do. And the truth is, God would be unjust if He actually looked at us and judged us that way, based on something within us. James Boyce says it this way. He says, even if God should save people on the basis of something in them, whether their faith, good works, or whatever, this would actually be injustice because people's backgrounds are unequal. Due to their natural temperament, 
or being raised in a believing family or whatever, it's easier for some to be more trusting than others. And for the same reasons, it's easier for some to be good and moral people in their own eyes. Or if God's election were based on these factors, it wouldn't be fair to those who are raised in violent, immoral, or pagan backgrounds. God doesn't look inside of you and say, because of you, I will save you. God saves you. It doesn't depend on exertion. Literally, that means to strive hard. To expend all of your strength to attain to something. And he's saying that your human will and your striving has nothing to do with it. You can bring nothing to the table. But then he transitions. He gives us a big but in this passage. Look at the verse 16, the latter part of verse 16 there. It says, but it depends on but on God who has what? It's all dependent on God's mercy. Eo, it means to help the afflicted or the wretched. And it's ultimately dependent on God's will, His plan, and His purpose. Mercy is a gift given at His pleasure. You can do nothing to attain it. And then he gives us an example of God's justice next. Look at the next section. He gives us an example of God's justice in verse 17. Look at, look at the first part of verse 17, for the, or all of verse 17, actually. Well, let's start with the first part. For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you. So God had a purpose. And who raised Pharaoh up? God put him there. Because God had a purpose. And he used Pharaoh to accomplish that purpose. It wasn't arbitrary. It was God's plan. And we all know the story. Moses goes to Pharaoh. He says, let my people go. And what does Pharaoh say? Nope. And throughout this exchange, multiple times, and and many of the uh, plagues that come because of it, Pharaoh, it says in Scripture, sometimes it says that Pharaoh hardens his heart. And at other times it says that God hardens his heart. And there are some who believe that, you know, Pharaoh hardened his heart enough that God said, okay, that's it, I'm going to harden your heart forever. Others believe that God raised up Pharaoh and hardened his heart from the beginning to use him as his vessel. Which one is true? Yes. They're both true. (laughs) Neither. God is God, and he has his own understanding of righteousness and justice. And the truth is, you and I don't understand God's mind, do we? In this side of heaven, we're not going to understand God's mind. And we'll never get to a point to where we will. And so unless someone here wants to stand up and say they know the mind of God, you don't have the answer to that question, do you? Is it worth fighting over? No. God raised him up. But eventually, God got the glory through it. Amen? But look at the next part of that verse. He says in the latter part of verse 17, there's, the purpose here is twofold. He says that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. In all of God's dealing with mankind, his power has been on display. In delivering his people, his power has been on display. In sending Jesus to the earth to die on the cross to be raised again, His power was on display. In the coming of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost, His power is on display. You see what I'm getting at here? God's power is on display in every dealing with this earth. And the second point is equally important, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Not just some parts of the earth, but in all the earth. And that was really Israel's purpose, wasn't it? That was really why God chose Israel, was that he was going to make a name for himself, and that he was going to use Israel to do what? To bless the nations. And that's what we see in this passage as well. Not only not only is he... Uh, going to show his power, but he's going to proclaim his name 
throughout the earth through His working with mankind. That was Israel's purpose. And today, it's our purpose. To show the power of God to a dying world and to proclaim the name of Jesus wherever we are. To all the world. And then finally, he, he, he makes a critical clarification of God's justice in this passage. If you look at verse 18, it says this, So then he has mercy on whomever he wills. It sounds like the beginning of the passage, right? But he takes it a step further. And he says, And he hardens whomever he wills. That one's a little harder, right? might be a hard pill to swallow, and that's where the idea of double predestination comes from. Uh, there are some who believe theologically that this passage is teaching that God from the beginning of earth has chosen people for destruction. And you're going to read about this next week uh, as Pastor Dustin preaches and the potter and, and the person who makes the clay and that he can say uh, to, the, to the clay and use him for whatever purpose he wants. But to suffice it to say, God is in control. He will have mercy on whomever he has mercy, and he will harden the hearts of those who do not. And if you are from the camp that believes that God uh, is conditioned on, or his election is conditioned on uh, something within you, then this idea is repugnant to you, right? Doesn't make sense. If you're from the other camp, you know, this is like your saving grace verse right here, right? This is... This is the smoking gun. But the truth is, until we get to heaven, we don't get to understand the complexity of what he's talking about. Are some people devoted just for destruction? And that answer just depends on how you see election. And you can debate that night and day. When I was in seminary, one of our classes was just that. It was a class where we had to hear lecture after lecture between those two views of, of uh, Calvinism and, and ultimately Arminianism, free will. And we had one class, and it was nothing but these two professors arguing back and forth. And you want to know what? Not a one of them ever got anywhere with the other. You know Why? Because none of them had the mind of God. They just have Scripture. And Scripture doesn't tell us the mind of God, does it? It tells us a whole lot, but it doesn't tell us the mind of God. Until you know the mind of God, you're not going to have the answer to this question. He's going to have mercy on whomever He wills. And He hardens whomever He will. There are tough passages in Scripture it doesn't mean we get to gloss over them. We have to take them. We have to read them. We, we have to do our best to try to understand them. But look, if you think he's just picking on, on this point, look just a few verses later in Romans 10. Look over there at Romans 10, verse 9 through 13. This is what he says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What is the requirement to be saved? Confess, believe. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the Scripture says, everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same is Lord, Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who, what? Call upon Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so you have this passage that's tough to deal with, and then you have this passage that talks about God, uh, that everyone who calls out to God will be saved. And then you have the passage in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, wishing, not wishing that any, God doesn't wish any would perish, but that all should reach repentance. Will all reach repentance? 
So we have to take all of Scripture together. We can't just take this little section of Scripture. We have to understand that God has mercy on those He has mercy. And He will harden the hearts of those He wants to harden. But that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that God's heart is in desires for everyone to be saved and to repent. We know that won't happen. And so Scripture is not just cherry-picked. It's all of Scripture. And we have to understand election. And we have to understand God's justice and will based on all of Scripture, not just our favorite passages. And until we attain to our heavenly existence, we see in part. We only see partially. We can't understand the mind of God. And even Paul himself admits that in Romans 11. Look at Romans 11, just a couple of pages over. Verses 33 through 36, he says this, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and amen. Let me give you the cliff notes. I don't have it all figured out. That's what Paul just said. We can't search the great mind of God, and we really shouldn't try to. We can take the Scriptures for what they say. You can leave the quarrels about things that we don't understand to the sideline, and we can be unified, moving together on the things that matter. And so we've got four main truths that we're going to pull from this passage today as we close out this, this morning. First, I must accept that God's justice is never in question. God's justice is never in question. We'll look at that more in more detail next week as to why that is, but just to suffice it to say, justice is only found in Him. He is the embodiment of justice. He is the standard of righteousness Injustice, and how can we question God's motives and His will when He is that very standard of justice? Here's the simple truth in this broken and sinful life we see in part. And the truth is, God uses tragedy to bring about victory time and time and time again. Throughout all Scripture, what looked like tragedy became God's victory in the end. And so we see things in part. Who are we to question what God's motives or what God's will is? There's a story of a lady who jumped from the third floor window of her apartment after finding out that her husband had betrayed her. The newspaper reported that she was recovering in the hospital after landing on her husband who was killed. <laughs> we see in part. And what looked like unjust, I mean, she was going to kill herself because of her husband. What looked to be unjust turned about to be justice. Amen? And that's how God deals with his people. We don't have all the information. We don't see everything. God is working his will and he's determining what he has determined from beforehand. Trust God. Trust his justice. Trust him. Number two, I must accept that God's will is supreme. That means it's supreme over our own wishes, our desires, our intentions. It's not depending on any of those things. God's will is His alone. He reigns supreme, and that might seem unfair. And when we are dealing with things that happen in life, with death, and those things that just seem unfair, and we ask the question of why would God allow that? And we don't understand. 
But the truth is God works good out of trouble and out of pain. Here's a quote from an invalid at birth who lived a lonely, obscure life in constant pain. Listen to how he puts it. Loneliness is not a thing of itself. It's not an evil sent to rob us of the joys of life. Loneliness, loss, pain, sorrow, these are the disciplines, God's gifts to drive us to his very heart. You ever thought of pain and suffering as a discipline? It drives us to his very heart to increase our capacity for him, to sharpen our sensitivities uh, and understanding, to temper our spiritual lives so that they may become channels of his mercy to others and so bear fruit for this kingdom. But these disciplines must be seized upon and used, not thwarted. They're not seen as an excuse for living in the shadow of half-lives, but as messengers, however painful, to bring our souls into vital contact with the living God, that our lives may be filled to overflowing with Himself in ways that may perhaps be impossible to those who know less of life's darkness. Can you imagine that type of understanding? But that's what it is. We look at pain and suffering as this imposition. But God sees pain and suffering as a discipline, as a way to draw you closer to Him. God's will is supreme. Even though we don't see a reason for what He does, it doesn't mean there isn't a reason. Many times we try to self-rationalize And the problem with self-rationalizing is that we assume something in ourselves. What is that? We assume goodness. We assume that somehow we deserve, that we're righteous, or that we're just plain good. We make ourselves the martyr. But the truth is, in times of trouble, we should lean into Him. We should seek His presence. God's will is supreme. You can neither change it or sway it. Let God be God and trust Him. I love what Paul David Tripp says. He says, The more you meditate on His glory, His power, His wisdom, His grace, and His faithfulness, His righteousness, His patience, His zeal to redeem, and His commitment to His eternal promise to you, the more you can deal with mystery in your life. It really is true that peace in times of trouble is not found in figuring out your life but in worship of the one who knows and has everything figured out already. Number three, I must realize that God's will reveals His glory. God's will reveals His glory. And there's no greater example of that than the story of Joseph. Joseph was hated by his brothers. They took him, stripped him of his coat, and threw him in a pit. They were trying to kill him, but his one brother saved him. They pull him out of this pit, and they sell him as a slave. He eventually ends up in Potiphar's house, where he is a slave. But God's favor rests upon him. And he works his way through that house to be pretty much in charge of that whole house. And then he's lied about and he's get put in prison. And all throughout this story, you're like, how is this fair? How is this right? But when you know the whole story and how it ends and how God used that to save his people from famine, he raised Joseph up for this very purpose that he knew many, much before we could ever have understood that there was going to be a famine and that his people would need food and would need a place of protection. And he brought Joseph through this hard time, through this life of trouble and pain to eventually raise him to a point to where he would save his own people from destruction. And that is the beauty of God's sovereign will. We don't see it all. We don't have to see it all. We just trust Him. That He is right. That He is good. And that He's working out salvation for His 
people and that in the end, God gets the glory. Time and time again, we see it in his dealings with his people. His glory is revealed. God alone gets that glory. And number four, I must realize that God's will should motivate my witness. We have a response in all of this. God's will declares his great name to the world, and similarly, his interaction with us should do the same in us. It should cause us to want to tell the world about what he's done in us. When we realize the depth of depravity from which we've come, when we realize the mercy of God on our lives, it should motivate us to be a witness. God owed us nothing but death and separation. Yet he gave us mercy. But he didn't stop there, did he? God owed you not one more thing, and yet he gave grace. Not only did he not give you what you deserved, but he gave you the things you do not deserve in the first place. That is grace. If you're here and you're struggling with this passage today, know that you're in good company. It's hard. It's a hard passage to deal with. But the only way to even come close to understanding is first to know the one who wrote it in the first place. You can't understand this passage from a worldly view. It won't happen. It will look unfair. It will look unjust. But until you have the Holy Spirit and His indwelling presence into you, this is just a bunch of babble. It makes no sense. The only way to understand is to come to a saving faith. And to do that, we must admit that we're sinners. We have to accept that, that there's nothing good within us. That there's nothing inherently good within us. That we don't deserve anything. We must admit that we're sinners. We must accept His free gift of mercy and grace through the cross, through His suffering, through His victory over death. We must believe that He is Lord and confess with our mouth and commit to following Him, raising up our cross daily and following Him. Only then can you truly see the glory of God and be empowered to share His goodness with the world. Would you pray with me?